The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This episode is brought to you by Australian Retirement Trust, a fund that's more super for you and your clients. With more than 2 million members and over $200 billion under management, they have more access to super smart investments at home and abroad. They're committed to working with over 4,000 advisors and delivering a world of investment opportunities to help your clients live the retirement they want. Visit australianretirementtrust.com.au forward slash advisor. Include Super Savings and Q Super FUM and members at June 2022. This week's guest is Deepa Surti. Deepa has been in the recruiting world for almost 30 years. And she loves working with all professional services, uh, but she has a particular passion for us in financial services. I actually have asked her to do a two-part series with me because I wanted to talk today all things hiring, and then next week we're going to talk all things from a candidate lens. So today we're unpacking everything that you should think about if you're intending on hiring someone, mistakes that are made, and how do you find a cracking candidate for your business. Deepa. Hey Jess, how are you going? Good, 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 good. Now, I am excited because I said to you a little while ago, not only do I want to do this podcast, please can you be on this podcast, but can we do two? <laughs> oh, sure. So, this is part one of our two-part chat. We're going to talk all things recruiting, but really specifically today, we're going to talk about this from the lens of people who are looking to hire. And we're going to go really deep and get your expert opinion on all things hiring in advice. So I think the natural place to start deeper is perhaps help us understand what does the financial planning landscape look like right now? Um, okay. From a, I think from a employer's point of view or just generally speaking, candidates, clients, from both perspectives, um, we've we've seen a lot of. There's a lot of demand for candidates with good skills, and if you're a financial advisor, power planner, CSO, it actually really doesn't matter across those different levels. Candidates are typically in demand at the moment. Um, I've, I, you know, over the three decades that I've been in this industry, I've actually, I actually think that the industry has always been a tough one in this space. Um, particularly if you're good at what you do. Um, if you're good at what you do, you're going to have options. Um, and it's, um, it's just important for the advisors or the, the hiring managers to recognize that, um, and understand that it is a tight market. It is a candidate market. Um, and I th- actually think it's just going to get tougher. Um, you know, the more advisors are leaving the industry, mm. people are becoming more educated. They want financial advice. Um, and so those advisors that stand out themselves, and particularly have a good attraction to be able to, or not a good attraction, but a good story to be able to sell to candidates about where they're going with their business. I think that's going to set them apart going down this journey of hiring. Yeah, you definitely hear from anyone that's hired recently that it is a really difficult market. And so um, I think, you know, you see it every single day. So it's nice to know that we're not alone in that thought, although it is a frustration. And I want to deep dive a little bit more specifically into some of the things that you've talked about. But maybe before we get there, I'm keen to think through from your end, like what is the sort of best practice when it comes to hiring? And perhaps before we get into that piece, 
what are the pros and cons? I know this might be a weird question because you're a recruiter, but can we talk about the pros and cons of actually using a recruiter? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and it's interesting. I actually like my clients to try and do their own recruitment um, and have a go at it. And I guess the reason why is they could probably then understand why I carry Nurofen in my handbag every day. Mm. Uh, it, it is it it's not simple. There's there's so many things that can go wrong. There's, um, you know, it, at the end of the day. It, there's a lot that can go wrong. and But I would say that by following a structured process, you try and eliminate that. And obviously, when you're hiring, it is risky. It, it You know, you can you can think you've got the right person and then all of a sudden that person, it, they just change on you or they exhibit behaviours that you just didn't know or you can't predict. At the end of the day, we're talking about people. So... I think the pros and cons are I would I would give it a go yourself if you've got the time or if you haven't done it, just give it a go so you can understand some of the pains and some of the pain points if you like and then um, you might be able to um, respect the process and understand the frustrations that recruiters actually go through. Um, it, But the, the biggest advantage I guess of using a recruiter is that they've done this quite a lot. They speak to candidates every day. They are um, in the market. They're listening. They know what types of questions to ask candidates. And if you're an employer that has to hire, sometimes you find it difficult to ask questions that a recruiter can. And this is why having a third party doing it for you can be quite beneficial. Um, people are uncomfortable about asking, you know, salary, salary, for instance, or you know, things like uh, a recruiter will be able to identify gaps in resumes and really deep down and go into it and understand, you know, if there's a gap in your resume. So talk me through what's happened over the last, you know, six months, 12 months, two years, whatever the gap might be. But these are questions that only a trained recruiter can really ask. Um, and and also as a hiring manager, you just might find it a bit uncomfortable to to ask those questions. So that that's definitely a good reason why you should use a recruiter. Another reason why you'd want to use a recruiter is it's very very time consuming process. It, it's time consuming, and also you know you, you've got your day job to do. And then can you imagine you've just got to sit there and you've got to recruit as well. A recruitment process can take weeks. And then let's just say you've got a great candidate and you don't get back to them for two days. You've lost the candidate, particularly in this market. Um, and candidates are actually interviewing you as much as you are interviewing them at the moment. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that in a, a little bit more detail. I think the time drain is a huge one that I actually underestimated initially. And um, it took hours and hours and hours out of my day. And you're right. It did create a really healthy respect for what recruiters do. and just how much work goes involved uh, is involved to get a to get a good candidate in front of someone can we talk a little bit about lead times that you're seeing for different roles like what's the average turnaround time would you say from say putting a job description up to having someone start in a business it comes down to i think it comes down to first of all, if you work backwards from notice period um, typically candidates have about 2 to 4 weeks of, of a notice period depending on their their level of like if they're a junior person you know, sometimes it's just one or two weeks. Um, if it's an advisor, it, you know, it could be, um, that, that they typically will have four, four weeks notice, but also they could get walked if they're also going to a competitor or another advice practice. Um, but to, I guess to answer your question, a, a good recruitment campaign from beginning to end, you need to allow at least I would say about four to six weeks to, to do the process properly and then you have to add on um, notice period. So it could be anywhere between six to, to 12 weeks really. And are you noticing, I've only seen this a few times, but when I've talked about it, people have said, oh, yeah, this is becoming more common for advisors having a three-month, yeah, a three-month notice period. In advisor world, I haven't sort of seen that a lot. I mean, I typically see it um for four weeks but I guess because it is a tight market and because now um advisors or employers are investing in um in taking on their new talent that 
perhaps they're just adding it to their contracts and their clauses now um, just just to try and keep those advisors a bit longer in their practice. It does make sense when you think about the handover process that obviously because then you need to recruit and then hand over your the, the clients of the person leaving. It obviously just puts a bit of a um, – a difficult spin on things. If you've been through that process, you found the right person and then you have to wait three months and a little bit because people obviously want to take a break as well. Normally it definitely caught me off guard. Had I probably given that a bit more thought, I would have started earlier. Yes. Yes. Do you find that people do that, that people in by the time they get to you and they've decided that they really want to hire, they're in quite a panic and a rush to get someone. Absolutely. Yeah, that's like 99% of the clients that I deal with um, because you suddenly have a resignation or, wow, you've just done a marketing campaign and you've just got all these leads and you just don't know, you just don't have the time to service it. So all of a sudden you panic attack and you need to hire. So, yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd want to plan that carefully and try and get um, a longer lead time. Yeah, and I, I'd imagine that that doesn't make for a great campaign when you're trying to find the best candidates and you've got someone pushing you to do it as fast as possible. Like those two things seem not incompatible but but really difficult to manage. Is that how it feels? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it just particularly – it depends on like if, you've, if you're working with a recruiter exclusively as well or if you've gone out to multiple recruiters. Going out to multiple recruiters just causes – urgency it causes I find that if you go to too many recruiters too quickly you're also can lack the quality and and the quality of the process is so so important um, for for an employer to make sure that they make the right hire um, so just just always think with quality and try to find that you know I, I need the best person for my for my business and if it means waiting a bit longer you should wait um, don't just rush into a hire. This might be a really silly question. Why do people go to multiple recruiters? Is it because they just want to see, do you have anyone that you know is looking immediately? Is that typically why this happens? Yeah, absolutely. And and what happens is, is depending on which recruiter they've got, they could have candidates um, on their books at the moment. But you know, again, typically if, if in this market, if you're a candidate, you're actively looking and you've got the right skills, you probably will get snapped up pretty quickly. So the reason why uh, an employer will probably go to multiple recruiters is they just, they've got a job, they've got an urgency and they need to fill it. Um, and so you're banking on different recruiters being able to have candidates that are ready to go. Um, so it's, it's not ideal because then you create competition amongst recruiters as well. I, I've got to admit, if, if I had a, if I had a managers come, coming to me and then they were using three other recruiters, what's my incentive to really sit there and help you find your right person when I know that I've got two or three other clients that are investing in me? to really work closely with them and find them someone right for their business. So it's a real good, it's a partnership. You've got to think of it as a partnership. Mm. And what are some of the things that you should consider when you're looking to take on or looking to use a recruiter? Okay. I think the first thing you need to do is obviously, let's just say you've got a bit of a short list of, of recruiters that you are looking to um, to chat with. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what you should be doing is, Let's first of all give them a bit of a brief as to what you're looking for. You don't have to go into anything very detailed. But what I would suggest is see what questions they ask you, okay, because then you're going to get an idea. Do they understand the industry? Are they Do they are they asking the right questions of you? Are they asking the right questions of you for what sort of what you're looking for, what your company is about, what your role is about? And that would just give you an indication as to, you know, how how experienced they are. So I think the other thing is the reason why you want to make sure you've got a, a recruiter that understands your business is you need them to be able to sell your role and your company and your um, culture, everything about you. So it's just important that you know that they know how to sell you and portray you in the market. So just following on from that, I think it's also, there's also a little bit of a connection. I think if you've got a bit of a connection with them and if you like their style, yeah. um, for me, I'm a very consultative style and I like that partnership approach. So um, I think that's really important when when you're looking for somebody, just watch out for the salespeople. 
I think that that's a really good point. And like, so that the recruiter can really get a feel for what you're looking for. Like, what do the best businesses do? Do they have like a briefing document? Like how do businesses brief you? The first thing you need to know or what you need to do as an employer is you must know what you want. Um, And so obviously you have to have a job description. 99% of recruiters will not go down a recruitment path unless they have a job description. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't. You have to have a starting point. Um, and when an employer puts a job description together, for instance, their style, their logo, everything about them should be captured on that job description as well. Um, because at the end of the day, you want to, you, you, your job description is actually your first selling point, A, to the recruiter that you're briefing and also to the candidate. Um, so invest the time to get your job description right. Um, and that's, that is just super important before you even start briefing a recruiter. Um, it's, it's the first thing we look for. It's the first thing we need to know about, about you, your company and exactly what the tasks are because every business is different and every role is different. And what are your tips and tricks around getting a great job description? I think what you mean putting it together or just the actual, what do you mean by that? Well, I think if, if, If the job description is like the first selling point. Yes. And obviously you've decided you want to hire. So you really want to put your best foot forward because it is a tight market. Are there some job descriptions that you look at and you're like, oh my gosh, this is beautiful or, oh my gosh, this is horrendous. And we're not going to be able to find the quality of candidate that they're looking for. And and if so, what delineates the two? Okay, so I think when you're putting your job description together or creating one, you remember it, this is a sales document. Remember it as it's the first thing a recruiter is going to see. It's the first thing that you want your candidates to to see. Um, so I would say reflect your brand, reflect who you are. Like if you've got values, put it in there. What's your business objectives? Put it in there. Um, and then when you're actually coming down to the job specification, be specific I love seeing weightings personally. I like seeing weightings and percentages on job descriptions assigned to a particular task um, because then the candidate goes, okay, so 60% of my role is this. Um, and then there's, you know, 2% of my role is to answer phone calls or, you know, whatever the case might be. But it just gives the candidate a good idea of, you know, what, what the expectations are. And it's in writing and it's upfront so that when they're on the job, they, you know, like I often hear um, candidates or employers saying, well, that wasn't in the job description, right? So if you can try and write your job description to be quite specific as well, that you, you just want to be as specific as you can and allocating weights and uh, percentages to the tasks is, is really good. Um, obviously, things come up along the way and sometimes you just need – you know, stuff done that's not necessarily in the job description. So that's why employers can put like a little thing in there saying other jobs tasks as required. And that kind of helps, helps you along the way. It's interesting. I think this probably, uh, firstly, this makes a lot of sense and I can understand why it would work not only for you who would have to explain more about the role, but also for someone trying to understand, well, what am I walking into? Um, if it's an existing role where someone's being replaced, I think obviously that's quite easy. I guess where it's complicated is if you're building a new role in a business and you don't have a huge handle on exactly the weightings of everything. Are there any other tips that you would give to us when building a good job description? I think, you know, then start, then start generic, um, but try and be, obviously try and sort of nut out like 70 or 80% of your job as much as you can. Um, and sometimes you build your jobs descriptions around the candidate that you're kind of seeing as well. So depending on, like if you can give a recruiter or if you're, if you're doing a job brief yourself and you put a job description together and there's about 20% you think, oh, I'm not really sure what else I need. Um, it's okay to build that in later on. And, and as you go through the recruitment process, you just might find a candidate that's got these skills that you could kind of go, well, you know what? I might be able to use those skills and add it to the job description. So it doesn't have to be final until you've got a candidate 
across the line or um, you're just about to make that offer and, and go down this onboarding path. So you can kind of hold back a little bit as well. And I understand if it's a new role, sometimes you just don't have all the answers or you just don't know everything up front. So um, look, just, just do as best as you can, try and get it as accurate as you can, and then you can always add to it and build to it later. And I mean, I've, I've just gone through the process with a couple of employees where they've needed to to do a job description and put something together as well. And, yeah, we had to add stuff to the job description later on because certain candidates bring certain things to the table and they decided to restructure part of their business and add some alloc- allocate some tasks to that candidate as well. And then um, it just broadened the role a bit more too and made it more challenging for the candidate because sometimes, you know, you, you could also even identify a candidate that's got these extra skills so let's add it to the job description, give them more responsibility and, um, you know, it might actually take some load off other people in the business as well and, yeah. How can you make sure in the hiring process you are really clearly articulating your culture? I think just be genuine and be who you, who you are and be yourself. Um, I think transparency is very, very important. I I think the people trying to oversell a role or oversell themselves or oversell their company to somebody and then that's not really who you are, then you've, you, you're going to go down a failed recruitment process um, because you're just going to be attracting the wrong person because it's not your culture and it, it's not who you are. So I think just be yourself and – um, and, and really talk about your values. Actually talk about your values through the recruitment process as well because it's who you are, you know, and you need to be able to put that part of your process. And at the end of the day, you've got to be able to – you want the person that's going to come and work for you to be um, compatible to your culture as well and, and who you are. Do you think it's easy to give candidates an insight into the culture in the recruitment process? I think so. I mean, I've dealt with so many different practices and I guess um, that, and this is why obviously if you do use a recruiter or whatever you choose to do, that it's really important to explain to the recruiter, well, this is what we're about. You know, if you're one of those, uh, you know, one of those practices that um, likes to uh, get involved in marathons or if you donate to charities or whatever the case might be, Make sure you talk about that because it's a reflection of you as a business and, you know, just you as human beings and, and that's where your heart is as well. Um, and people resonate with that as well because at the end of the day, yes, they're looking for a job, but it's, it, you, you know, you just might, you just might see a candidate that's got those, those attributes that are also really important to them. And you, you, you could just get another amazing person that just, adds to your culture and just further develops it. So talk about your culture during the process. Um, I find that uh, particularly in this market as well, I think the first part of the recruitment process should be about culture and should be about what you're doing in your business and what's important to you. Mm. I think, you know, coming back to that piece around authenticity, what I was thinking when you were saying that was a wonder like in a small business where it's you and you are the company culture, you know, being authentic is really great. And that's really um, easy to articulate. This is who we are. But I wonder like in a bigger business where there's many partners or lots of advisors or lots of people in there, it probably does become a bit harder to convey culture. Yeah. It it comes down to divisional then. Um, Obviously as a leader in a large organization, you're there to sort of, I guess, um, have have an share the overall vision of the company but different managers have got different management management styles and at the end of the day they've got to um be successful in their team so if 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 you're a good fit for them and their business and their team i think it's got to come down to a team team setting um and and see what um if you're going to be working for a particular manager, do you get on with your manager? Can you feel that chemistry and can you feel that synergy? And I think people are really responsive and receptive to that feeling as well, um, particularly if you've been around for a long time. Um, you, you just get a good feel of people in the end. Uh, interestingly, you like personality profiling. 
And I'm keen to know why and what do you see come out of them that you think helps make sure that you are selecting the right candidate? I think personality profiling, um, it basically validates parts of your recruitment process, um, but I don't think it should be the thing that is the deciding factor. I think you should use it as part of the process. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit problematic when you like, you know, in this market and perhaps you've only got one candidate at the end. And what happens if they don't meet your profile that you, you know, is in your world, the perfect person, then as in a business, you have to look at it and you go, okay, so there's a few things that are off on this profile, but can I use those parts that are not quite right? And is this a person that I can train for the parts that they've just, I don't know, maybe not have scored what you wanted them to score? Um, you know, particularly like, let's just say it's a, um, a business analyst role or something like that, or a, a role that requires a lot of analytical skills. Yes, I'm a strong believer in these profiling because I think that you can't have somebody being in an analyst role or high, like an actuarial role, for instance, and they score poorly on the mathematics. It's, it, it's going to be a reflection on the job, unfortunately. Um, but I think overall, as a hiring manager, they're good to use in conjunction with everything else. Um, and do towards probably about it, like between the second and the third last, like either between the first and the second interview or the second and the third interview. Um, because you also don't want to scare off candidates either. Um, mm-hmm. some, some organizations just will not do it. And, you know, they might have had a number of rounds of interviews and, it, you don't want to scare off your candidates so that if you put them through a profiling, then, um, and, but you know, like they're also looking at three other companies and they're not doing any profiling, then you just got to think about it and you go, Oh God, do I really want to do this? Or, um, is there experience and references enough for me as an employer to take, to take this person on? So I think also do it on a case by case basis as well. Um, otherwise you just might fall short and not get a candidate at the end at all. Because people are terrified of having a personality profile done? Yeah, yeah. It is Particularly scary. the long ones, like I know some organisations in particular, well, one in particular I can think of, that three hours, it's quite daunting. And you know what? You know, when people do the personality profile, are they answering the question because it's really them or is it? are they answering the question because it's, I think this is what they want me to say. So there's a little bit of that abnormality in that process as well. So... Um, I would just say I like I do like using them, but I would also be um, using it as part of the overall process. Okay, and then let's talk about that process in more detail. So, I'm keen to learn a bit more from your perspective on specifically the interviewing process. How many interviews often are people having? Who are they having them with? And what do you find works quite well? Okay, if if it's a if it's directly, if you're, say, you're doing your own hiring, um, it's typically going to be that it should be the person that's on the phone calling them. So if you're a manager, they've responded to you and, and, um, you're the person that's going to be, you know, you're the person that's taking them through the process. Um, I think it should be that person because you're the person that needs to get them in the door as well. So that phone call is really, really important as well because you actually have to sell to them and get them in the door to come and meet with you. Um, so I would say, and again, it depends on the role. Let's just say for junior candidates, some in this, and again, in this market, and I've got to admit, it's been through all my years of recruitment, junior candidates, you may not have the leisure of having two interviews Um, because, believe it or not, junior candidates such as a, um, uh, like just a little office junior, everyone wants a great office junior. They're actually one of the hardest candidates to find Um, and you sometimes you just have to pounce and unfortunately you just got to be really, really quick, but not unfortunately, but with junior candidates, you got to move fast. So let's just say, Jess, you're that person that's invited the candidate in, you've got that hour to impress them as much as they've got to impress you. And then if you feel like, oh, this person's really good and John Smith, who's in your office, is is also there, you might just want to grab them in at that point as well Um, because you might lose them because at that level – they 
everyone's everyone wants a good office junior and so they're going to typically at that level go with the first good offer that they see conversely if you've got say a um let's just say it's a general manager or a, a, a quite a se- senior role um it could take a while i just i just did a role for a company it took us nearly 6 months and how many interviews would that person have six had? six yeah mm. that that includes me um it's just it it was a very, very important role for this business. They had to get it right. And, and conversely, the candidates needed to make sure it was the right decision for them. Um, when you're, when you're obviously a senior manager and you're very good at what you do, you're looking at other businesses. So you've got to make the right decision. Mm-hmm. And this is going back to what we're talking about with culture and everything as well. It's really important to get that upfront, that message across. And everyone that you get involved in the interview process, make sure they're saying the same story. Obviously, they're going to have different perspectives and different ideas, but you want to have the same story. So you've got to make sure your whole interview process, everybody's in line with, um, that they agree on the, on the same things and that you've all thinking the same things as well. I'm just sitting here giggling because I'm like, okay, this is a little bit Goldilocks. Like it feels like one interview is totally not enough and six Mm. is so many. Like surely there's something nice in between, but I, I think, When you're looking for staff that are perhaps administrative or, you know, earlier on in their career, they're probably just wanting a new job. And so if they do get a good offer and it meets all of the criteria that they really look for, they go really quick. Absolutely. And sometimes you, that's why I'm saying sometimes you don't have the leisure of multiple interviews. Um, and, and sometimes, you know what, at the end of the day, if they've got the skills on paper, their resume looks great, you've gone through the technical assessment, you've gone through the skills assessment and they tick a lot of your boxes and you just know you've got to run with it. Mm, it's scary but it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I literally had just went through a junior high with another one of my clients and they made a decision in 24 hours. Wow. And I guess if you have really done all of the – the processes that we've talked about up to this point. So you've really articulated well what the role is. You've briefed the recruiter if you use one. You've been able to convey company culture. Like you've you've actually done a lot of the work well before that. It just feels like meeting someone for the first time and then saying, come on in. I I am actually genuinely. It's like a dating game, isn't it? (laughs) It is. I'm like, whoa, we haven't even dated yet. I know. Mm, Food for thought. Um, Given that the market is quite tight, what can you or what are you seeing businesses do to really make sure candidates see them as an employer of choice? Okay. Um, I think my first point on that would be um, your brand is really, really important and I think that let's just say you're an employer that's constantly on social media um, and are delivering, you know, webinars, seminars, whatever you're doing and you're actively involved in charities or whatever you're doing, just keep on advertising that and keep on highlighting that. That is your brand and that's what's going to – that's part of your sell because at the end of the day you have to sell yourself. Um, but, you know, also in a post-COVID world, things have changed a lot and and people got used to working from home but at the same time they're also itching to get back into the office as well. So it, just, it does depend on um, people's circumstances as well. But I think that be flexible um, listen to what your candidates are saying. And, you know, if you've got a great candidate that has to, you know, might have two kids and they need to be at school at nine o'clock and they can't get into the office till 9.30, quarter to 10, but they're willing to stay back. Well, if you've got a great candidate and you can be a bit flexible around their personal lives, then absolutely. Because there's got, there are so many employees that I've dealt with in the past as well. They're so rigid. You have to be here at this time. You've got your lunch break at one o'clock. Lunch is from one to two. Oh yeah, it happens. And that's just somebody, that just creates an environment of fear. And um, why would you want to go and work for someone like that when I can work with another firm that's in the same industry, but respects me and trusts me? And I think it comes down to trust as well. You do have to trust and, but, you know, trust, trust your employees at the end of the day, because they, if you're trusting them, they're going to deliver for you, um, because you mm. support them. 
Mm. Yeah. But again, and it also comes down to if it's a junior candidate or a senior candidate, look into, you know, uh, you know, what, what their, you know, circumstances are. You can't go too, too far into it from a personal point of view, but just be adaptable and, and have, have that point across very early on that, um, you know, we're adaptable to people's individual circumstances and, and we're happy to help you. And flexibility does seem like, you know, more than ever, a necessity. Yes. Not like a nice to have anymore. You know, we're in a world where people are wanting hybrid working environments. People are wanting to be able to spend more time with their family and take, you know, certain afternoons off and then make back the time. And it just seems like, you know, you're going to, in already a difficult market, you're going to push away really good talent because they won't want to work. I am still hung up. No, no, no. I was going to say I'm hung up about the the um, idea that people are prescriptive in the hiring process around people's lunch times. Oh, yeah, yeah. That That's that's another topic of conversation. But, like, um, I have seen it in employers um, and – yeah, let's not say it's, it does happen. It does happen. It's a good expression of culture. It really articulates who you are as a business. I'm not sure it would put your best foot forward, but it's, you know, I'd actually prefer to know it. You know, if someone was going to try to make me take lunch at a set time, I'd actually prefer to know it in the hiring yeah. process because I wouldn't want to work for a company that does that. So maybe it's Correct. good that they do. And maybe some people yeah. thrive on that, but I yeah. think that that's fine. I mean, look. It's, it's also very true of junior candidates because ju- typically junior candidates know that their hours are 8.30 to 5 and they know they get an hour lunch and they know that they can have a morning tea and an afternoon tea. Um, it's just kind of what's been built in them. Um, but if you're an employer just says, look, at the end of the day, here are your tasks. If you get your job done, it, we, we don't mind how you use your time. Um, but they obviously have to be more closely managed than, say, somebody that's got 10 years experience and mm. know what they're doing. It's just a different, it's just a different game. The junior candidates do need a bit more, I guess, closer management and perhaps mentoring and training. Some of them may not have even been in the workforce before. So they, they don't know what protocol is. Um, and this is why if you've got a great culture that trusts and, and, and has this accountability, um, and, and really trusts their employees that you, you just, you just got a great culture already and, and you're already 10, 10 steps ahead of your competitors. Mm. I called someone from my team yesterday morning and she called me back about an hour later and she's like, I'm sorry, I had to go and do Pilates. I was like, God, what are you? <laughs> There you go. Well done you for getting Pilates class in nice and early. I'm having coffee and she's like, great. And um, it made me really happy because, you know, we are trying to make sure that our team know like, yeah, there's a lot of work to do, but get up and move and go and do your Pilates. And it doesn't have to be at lunchtime if that's not what you want to do or the class isn't right or your PT can't do then like, I don't care. I don't care as long as you move your body and that makes you more productive and happier and healthier and you can get your work done. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Deepa, what do you do when you when you interview and I've we I've seen this someone interviews really well. They seem so great and then they come in and they are not who they were in the interviewing process. This is why you have probation periods. Mm. It's unfortunate we are talking about human beings and you can't always get it right. And somebody could be exceptional at interview. Let's just say they're a salesperson. They're selling themselves. They're really good. But they come to your environment or they've been they've been a they've been blitzing it in their last environment. Their culture was right for them. It was a different type of management. They come into in your environment Maybe the culture just wasn't that bright after all. It's, it, if I had a glass ball and if, if, if I had, if I, if I could see deep into the future about what that would look like, geez, I think every, it would be a really happy workplaces, but you just cannot. How do you predict that? It's, you obviously want to do everything you can up front to try and get the right person at, from the beginning, but there's always going to be those odd times where you just, don't get it right. Mm. And it's tricky, right? Because they're it's trying hard. to put their best foot forward because they want a absolutely. new role. And what so a- are you. And absolutely mm. so are you. And and but 
you know, just something might trigger them in the workplace or something might trigger you in the workplace and then you go, oh, geez, I just I didn't see that. I, I, I just didn't pick up on that in the recruitment process. And you can miss it. So just don't don't shoot yourself. Don't don't it just happens. It's it's people. Mm. You know? So and, and some people are going to be good in one environment, but they may not be good in another environment. So just that's just just put it down to an error and you unfortunately just have to move on. Last question on helping people find good candidates and bring them in. Once they're in the business, I don't know whether you see much of this actually, so you tell me if you don't, but once they're in the business, how are you seeing people make sure that, um, I guess they're not candidates, they're new employers by now, um, how are they properly onboarded to ensure that they do feel like, okay, I've, I've made the right fit and I feel really comfortable in this new role? Yeah, I think I think first of all have someone there at the door to greet them and you know what, would you like a coffee? before we go on a tour. Just, you know what, they're humans at the end of the day. Offer them a coffee. Let me take you for a tour. Let me show you your team. Let me show you your desk. Make sure their desk is set up. Oh, my God, the number of times I've seen candidates go start a job, they don't even know where they're sitting. They don't even have a computer. They don't have a password. So they spend two days trying to get that right, but that's actually the employer's job. They, they need to have all this sorted. If as an employee you don't have that right, please don't start them. <laughs> Wait till it's all set up um, so that their experience is a good experience because if it looks like schmozzle when they start, is that a reflection of who you are and am I going to last in this environment? Mm. One of my clients, you know, just uh, we hired last November, they started in February. She had a beautiful bunch of flowers in her office. I'm not saying give a bunch of flowers to everybody, but it was just a reflection of we're so excited to have you here and here's a bunch of flowers to, to lighten up your desk. Mm. It is those little things that... It's little things. You would totally want. Like how nice yeah. would that be? Even a coffee, I'd be yep. super happy. But, you know, I, um, I work in a... Well, when we're there in a bigger office. And actually one of the things that we clocked once we brought someone in was it's a really confusing floor plan and people were like new hires were getting lost in our yeah. office because we work in a co-working space and they kept not knowing where the exit was because they were in the wrong corner or where the, yeah. the, the bathrooms were. And so we were like, oh, gosh, we actually need to make – because we obviously <laughs> take them around the, them the floor. Tour. And like, here, here, here. But like, actually, no, you need to take them around a few times and be like, oh, okay. And remember, this is the exit for this road. And this is where you go for here. Because they were, they were like dazed and confused walking. So around. you might need to give them a GPS tracking system or something. A map. Here's the map. Oh, yes. This is how you find your way back. <laughs> no, but, just put, just put arrows on the floor. This is the way to the toilet. <laughs> oh, but you know, you totally take all of that stuff for granted. Yeah. And yet, Imagine the fear when someone's new and they're trying to look competent and something as small as that can throw you totally. But you know what? Like just certainly in your business and your culture, like you guys wear T-shirts, right? So (laughs) what a great gesture. If you're all wearing your T-shirt and then all of a sudden they walk in and they're wearing a shirt, here's your T-shirt. Welcome to the team. Yeah. Yeah. Straight away. They fit in, you know? And then we do a pub yeah. lunch. We have a tradition. And then you do a pub lunch. Do a yeah. pub lunch. <laughs> okay, so they maybe skip the coffee. They maybe skip the coffee. <laughs> we have lemonades, but we have a local pub that we take everyone to as part of the welcome process. But um you can see, like having done this to varying degrees of success, I think every time you hire, you really and you've been through the end to end process, I find that I look back and and actually we talk about it as a team. <laughs> We're like, okay, we could have done this part so much better or we should have done x y or z and it's it is one of those things where you aren't dealing with people and you've got to make mistakes and you do sort of build out a bit of a toolkit of okay if we're going to do this again how do we get it Mm. better for the next hire but often the lessons are quite expensive lessons and they're painful any other tips or tricks for people that are hiring i think um just just be genuine in your approach. Just be transparent. Um, don't hire for the sake of hiring. Um, you know, like I know you might have a need and you're desperate to fill a job. Maybe have a plan B before you go in and understand that it, it is a tight market. We're talking about individuals, but candidates are, again, depending on the industry, they are interviewing you as much as 
you're interviewing them. So just it just might take you a bit longer to find the right person and maybe you just need to have a plan B as well. Um, and, and, and actually one other thing I would say is that, yes, have a plan B as well, but also look for people that may not have all the skills that you want. They might be from a different industry, but they've got transferable skills. I find my biggest um, success stories come from those candidates that have didn't have the skills that the employer wanted in the first place, but they, God, they had the passion and they had the attitude and they had the energy because they badly wanted it. And for me, that's more important sometimes than just the full skill sets that you're looking for in the first place. Mm. Thank you so much for helping it's us okay. demystify the hiring process and help people, you know, really hopefully not make those ex- expensive mistakes mm. and really understand from a recruiter side of things, how do you put your best foot forward when you're looking to hire? Thanks, Deepa. No problem. Nice chatting. <laughs>